Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Richard Dreyfus to Stand By Me, River Phoenix to Explorers, James Cromwell to The Green Mile, Jeffrey DeMunn to The Shawshank Redemption, Gail Bellows to Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, Javier Botet, It. sincerely repents on what he'd done wrong that he might get to go back to the time that was happiest for him and live there forever would that be what heaven's like i just about believe that very thing john coffee you have been condemned to die in the electric chair by a jury of your peers sentence imposed by a judge in good standing in this state questions do you leave the light on after bedtime i know violent men i deal with them day in and day out there doesn't seem to be any real violence in him. Until he kills a couple of little girls. John Coffey is a murderer. I don't think he did it at all. Take my hand, boss. You see for yourself. You're talking about a miracle? I do not see God putting a gift like that in the hands of a man who would kill a child. Miracles are funny things. You never know when they're going to happen. And when they happen in a place like this, that's the most unbelievable miracle of all. This is the story of a miracle. that happened here, where I work. On the Green Mile. Okay, guys. Are you sure about this? Oh, yes, Tom. For the last time, we've talked about doing a theme for each one of these episodes. Yeah, like, you know, last week we built that spaceship out of junk. Yeah, and the body by the tracks the week before. And just real quick about that. Just whose body? Okay, he strapped in. Wait. <sighs> Gentlemen, I give you the Fire Pit Podcast first electric chair. Electric chair? Wait, wait, wait! I thought I thought this was just supposed to be a skit about supernatural powers. What? Wait, what? Yeah, we ditched that idea when you tried to fondle Dan. Yeah, not cool, Tom. Once was forgivable, but really, four times? I was in character. No, wait, that was you who was doing the fondling. <clears throat> yep, well, now I am in character. No, no, Josh, Josh, help, Josh. Why? Josh? The electric chair was my idea. This. Relax, Tom. Calm down. It's not even plugged in. We just need it for a prop and some pictures. Um, yeah. Anywho, um, so we need to take some pictures. Okay. Okay. You know, the lighting sucks in here. Hey, Dan, hit the lights, please. Got it. No, no, not that one. <laughs> My bad. That was unexpected. What was unexpected? <laughs> I didn't see your skeleton light up like on TV. The sparks were a nice touch, though. Didn't expect those either. Hey, an unexpected surprise. I know, right? <laughs> <sighs> uh, I hate the both of you. Hello, bots and listeners, and welcome to another electrifying episode of the fire pit Ugh. oh shut up 
you both strap me into an electric chair, you have no rights to complain. Any hoot, I'm Tom, British name Thompson. And now that the burns have mostly healed, we're back on the field trip to Kingtown. We hope you enjoyed a coming-of-age story about dead bodies and light-hearted movies about aliens that talk TV because it's getting pretty dark from here on out. Grim. Ooh, spooky, 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 spooky. But as per our, our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film, Explorers, and moved them into this film. Now, to tell us what we're watching and who we're watching in spooky voice tones, I turn it to Nigel. Not doing the spooky voice. Thank you, Tom. Sorry about that. Not doing the spooky voice. Still funny, though. That, and I meant the funny part was the electric chair, not the spooky voice. That, that's disagree. still funny. Still I funny. disagree. Disagree. Anyways, I'm Dan, British name Nigel, and last week we watched Ethan Hawke and River Phoenix build a spaceship out of garbage using a computer that wasn't even plugged in. Still on that. James Cromwell played River's dad in a bit part, and tonight we will follow him into prison in the Green Mile, another Stephen King film on our trip. And to give us a rundown on the film and a little bit of trivia, I'll turn things over to Josh. God damn it, I think I cut my hand on hooking Tom. Shut up, Tom. Thanks, Dan. Uh, yes, I'm Josh, British name Reginald, and as Dan mentioned, tonight we're walking the Green Mile. It is a 1999 supernatural drama starring Tom Hanks, Michael Clark Duncan, and the aforementioned James Cromwell, based on a novel of the same name by Stephen King. So this movie was released December 10th, 1999, had a budget of $60 million dollars, an international box office, or worldwide box office, of $286 million. Domestically, it pulled in $136 million. Uh, Are you sure it wasn't $136,000, Josh? Yes, Tom. Why would you even mention that? That's dumb. And you're dumb for saying it. <laughs> so it had a Rotten Tomato score of 78%, an IMDb score of 8.5%. It premiered second in the box office with 18 million, competing with another Tom Hanks movie, Toy Story 2, which grossed just 200,000 more than that at 18.2 million. And Toy Story 2 was on its fourth week of release. So it, it narrowly uh, beat out Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, by about $6 million, which was also released that same weekend. The major box office explosion that was Deuce Bigelow, it beat that. Yeah, that was I'm joke. honestly more amazed that that movie premiered at three on the box office. Yeah. <laughs> Slow weekend, I guess. I don't know, Green Mile and Toy Story 2. Yeah, but what else was there? That was Dogma. Three. Dogma was that same year? Yeah, that's 99. I could pull it up. Yeah, it was a pretty stout weekend. Really? Wow. Yeah. All right. The World is Not Enough, Arnold Schwarzenegger's End of Days, Sleepy Hollow, Denzel's Bone Collector, Pokemon, okay. the first movie, Mewtwo Strikes Back. I think Bone Collector was on its sixth release. Everything else was newer than that. Huh. But yeah, so it was a fairly robust weekend. Yeah, okay. Wow. And Deuce Bigelow made number three out of all those films. I'm not surprised at all about Green Mile doing as well as it did. It's just... Deuce Bigelow throws me off. Sorry, I derailed us there. Just mm -hmm. was one of those things that you never expect. But continue. Yeah. Sorry like about that. Paul Blart staying in the top five for what, like six years? <laughs> it felt like six years. Yeah, yeah, we've already we've already strapped him to an electric chair tonight, Josh. Let's not pour salt and lemon in the wounds there by mentioning Paul Blart Mall Cop. <laughs> <laughs> There's more on that story later. Anywho, so this movie is actually a literal interpretation of the TV trope, What Happened to the Mouse? King hadn't come up with an ending for the mouse in the movie yet, and he gave his wife the manuscript to read, and she asked him, well, what happened to the mouse? And he gave the mouse a resolution, which uh, that trope actually doesn't come from that movie. It was a reference to the movie The Last Emperor, in which the title character violently throws his beloved pet off screen. I totally to stole that from TV Tropes. So Yeah, but she made that question before TV Tropes was ever a thing, so... Maybe she became the sideways trope namer. Could be. It could be one of those misattributions or misattributed type things. Like yeah. everybody quotes somebody with some a famous line that they actually never said. So, could be. But interestingly enough, John Travolta was originally offered Tom Hanks' role, but he turned it down to do, uh, what the fuck was that movie? I, I forget that movie. 
Battlefield Earth? Is no, 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 one? no, no. He didn't turn it down to do Battlefield Earth because I don't think Battlefield Earth comes out for another year or two. He turned down the role and then he got to work on securing Battlefield Earth. Uh, mm-hmm. That was one of Travolta's pet projects or something like that. So he basically turned down this movie to go work on what would eventually become Battlefield Earth. And I think we can all agree that that was a great decision. <laughs> Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. Because it gave us Battlefield Earth. If we ever get to that movie someday, it's the best unintentional comedy I've ever seen in my life. Yes. <laughs> Try so hard to be good, but it fails at that and ends up being hilarious. Asterix, not in the good way. Yes. Yeah. But uh, continuing on with what we learned in Stand By Me, this is actually takes place in the same universe as Shawshank Redemption, The Stand, Stand By Me, and It, and Dolores Claiborne. So connected universe long before the MCU. Yeah, wouldn't it have been better if, like, it chapter two, right before Pennywise is about to kill them, you just hear Richard Dreyfuss's voice say, on your left, and then the other characters from the other Stephen King movies <laughs> come in to help them fight Pennywise? Oh, my God, yes. Oh, damn it. Yeah, you just hear Richard Dreyfuss say, on your left, and then... <laughs> Portals music plays. Yeah, and then, like they all show up, and then Richard Dreyfus says again that he never had friends like the friends he had when he was twelve. Yeah, I can't, <laughs> I can't right. see it. Dolores Claiborne walks out with her sledgehammer. Um, Michael Clark Duncan shows up, just giant hand on Pennywise's shoulder. You hear uh, Morgan Freeman say, "You get busy dying." Yes. <laughs> Tim Robin walks out with that little yeah. like uh, hatchet thingy that he used. <laughs> Pennywise is trying to go for someone, then Cujo just goes straight for the neck, yeah. dude, the, and then he gets uh, run over by the car from Maximum Overdrive, which came in in the same portal as Christine. Yes, I Terry think walks in. Oh. Oh, then Arnold Schwarzenegger is the running man. Oh, and then John Cusack walking with the key to 1408. All topped off with the cherry on the top with Samuel L. Jackson walking in. Because he was in 1408, too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, he, but, but he looks like Nick Fury. I lost my eye after he stayed with us. Exactly. Like, why wasn't this the thing? You guys let Marvel beat you to this, and you had a connected universe decades before this. I know. What's wrong with them? I think it was an incredibly missed opportunity there. (laughs) Like, I I wonder if Stephen King loses sleep at night, knowing that that didn't happen. Technically, wasn't Dark Tower, and I don't know a lot about Stephen King, but wasn't Dark Tower supposedly like his endgame? Yeah, sort of was, yeah. Because there were bits and pieces that connected all that universe together, and they got one of the kids from Pet Cemetery to team up with the gunman, Gunsmith, whatever the character's name was. Because, yeah, didn't he write himself into that, too? Like, at some point into the Dark Tower series? I'll have to consult with people who've actually read that book series, because I don't know. I think he got hit by a car, or like one of the characters in the book hit him or something. I forget what it is, but I do know that he wrote himself into his own book. Which I'm like, that must have been very meta of him. I've been writing this long. Why can't I be a character in my book? Come on. The car careened off of his his chiseled abs and his six foot stature. And his long, glorious hair waved in the wind. And he looked at him and stared him down. And with that stare, he saw right through him. And then his knees felt weak and he fell to the ground. And then he said, I, I am Stephen King. I am your God. And then he just walked away. And from that moment on, I knew I'd witnessed something, but I don't quite know what. But I was in his presence and his six-pack abs. The end. Okay, we have a three and a half hour movie to get through, <laughs> and uh, we still haven't discussed what we want to get out of it. I know what I and, want to get uh, out of it, and that's never a narration like that ever again. So. I love how Dan is frustrated, but Tom is in reverence. He's, <laughs> and you see the look on his face. Well, his jaw was on the floor. Well, he wanted me to keep going. You, you, could, you could see the disappointment seething out of him as you cut me off. Well, in Tom's defense, he was just electrocuted in an electric chair earlier. His brain is probably fried. That's the truth. This is true. But honestly, yeah, no, Nigel, what do you plan on getting out of this other than no more Josh narration? I haven't seen this movie in a while, and I know I say that almost every episode, but it's true. I, I just haven't seen this one. Last time I saw it was on, I think I mentioned it last in last week's episode, that the last time I saw this was on VHS, and then Josh pointed out correctly that it was two VHS tapes. Mm-hmm. And so, and if I have 
seen in a while. I've only seen it once. So I think I'm kind of wanting to see, I don't remember much about it because it's been so long since I've seen it. So maybe I kind of want to understand what all the fuss is about because this is considered one of the, like not one of the best movies ever, but it, it's generally loved. Apparently it's a very emotional movie to a lot of people. They cry at certain scenes and uh, it affects them for days afterwards. And so maybe the last time I saw this, I was just too young to really appreciate that. I guess I just kind of want to see what all the fuss is about with this movie. All right. Reginald, what about you? I'm kind of in the same boat as Dan. Like, it's been, God, decades probably since I've seen it. I hate that I can almost say that. I guess technically I can't say decades because it hasn't been, it's been 20 years since this movie came out. Uh, (laughs) Just about, no, 11 years. It's only been 11 years. So, wait. Tom does math bad. (laughs) <laughs> oh, oh boy does tom do math bad 21, 21. years Ooh. oh yes. Yes. Uh-oh. the 90s was 21 years ago tom oh but, uh, boy so probably hasn't been decades because i probably watched it uh last time i watched it was before i graduated high school and I graduated in 02, so it tells you how long ago it's been since I've sat down and watched this. I've seen Shawshank Redemption much more recently, but uh, this one, it's been a while. And I don't even know if I've ever seen it all the way through. Like, I, I think I said in a previous week episode that i seen bits and pieces of it, or I don't think I've seen it all the way through in a single setting. I don't know how accurate that is, because like I said, it's probably been close to 20 years since I've seen it. But yeah, I do remember bits and pieces of the movie, because my parents watched the shit out of this movie. I even mentioned it to them. That that's what we're watching tonight. My mom got all in the hizzy. She's like, oh my God, I want to watch it. I'm only saying that because she says she listens to the episode, but she doesn't, so I can make fun of her in that way. I love you, Mom, but I know you're not going to listen to this. So I'm looking forward to watching it because, again, like Dan said, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing what the fuss is about. Sure. Tom, what about yourself? Well, again, this is another film where two people have seen it, one more recently than the others, and one of us hasn't, and I am that one that hasn't seen it. It's one of those Stephen King films that everyone actually loves. This was an Oscar-nominated film. It's one of those movies that everyone rants and raves about. Well, I can't really say rants too much, but it, it's it's a classic for a reason. So I'm looking forward to seeing for myself what all the hizzy is a busy. Uh, I, I don't expect that I'm going to hate this film. I expect I'm going to like it. And as well as anyone likes a piece of art. Will I be entertained? Probably. Will I be wowed? Hopefully. But I don't think I'm going to hate this film. There's a very slim chance of that going in. Come on. You've got Michael Clark Duncan. You've got Tom Hanks. You've got Gary Sinise. You've got so many A-class actors, writers, director. Including have- the actor we're using tonight to get into this movie, Richard Cr- or uh, James Cromwell. James, James Cromwell. My bad. No, no. Call him by his real name. Zephyr from Cochran. Cochran. Yeah, I did my bad. I almost said Zeph from Cochrane too. That's why I was like Zeph, said Cro- Zeph from Cromwell. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I don't think is Gary Sinise in this one. He has a very brief part. Very, very brief. The, uh, the um advertising for this movie made it seem like he had a much oh, bigger, yeah. bigger role in the movie. And because they were trying to play on the fact that he's in um Forrest Gump with Tom Hanks, and he was also in Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks. And both of those movies at the time were and still are considered some of the best ever, critically acclaimed, but mm. he still has a part in the movie. And we all can't forget Michael Clark Duncan. I know he passed away in, what, 2012? That man was an amazing actor. And yeah. I got to say, he's probably his most memorable role had to be Kingpin from 2003's amazing epic Daredevil. I think he's this a- movie would like a word, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he was also in Armageddon. Yes, he was. Yeah, I know when he did die, it was that was a sad day for Hollywood. It was a shocking thing too. He, I didn't yeah. think he was sick or anything like that. But between him and Black Panther, just yeah, like, it was just Chadwick very Boseman, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chadwick Boseman's death is very similar in the sense that like no one saw it coming. Like yeah, no one even knew he was sick, and then you find out no, he, yeah, he died of like cancer you're like wait he had cancer yeah so again mm-hmm. michael clark duncan just everything you heard about him back in the day just a stand-up guy just quality human being and you hate when someone like that's taken especially early in their lives way too early and yeah yeah same same with chadwick but this is going to be a good one 
I'm going to like it. But I know for a fact that there are some people who have some contrary opinions about this film. So how really? about... Really? Why don't you quiz us on that there, Thompson? Well, I think I will, Josh. Thank you. Yes. So as usual, I've got at least five reviews from IMDb here, all between one star to ten star. I will give you a sentence or two from their review, and you guys have to guess whether it's a one star, two star, blah, 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 down to ten star. And whoever gets the most points wins. What do we win? Chlamydia. That was my joke from last week. Hang on, hang on. Veto. Hey, Veto. Hey, Veto. Yeah, we don't, on, we don't on, award the same. Yeah, they, thank you. Herpes, not chlamydia. We don't award the same reward twice. Okay, chlamydia <laughs> has a cure. So Herpes I, is the gift I, that keeps on giving. I'm going to sandbag this one and just go ahead and let Josh win. <laughs> Question review riddle one. This one is from MDL Film. Uh, they wrote... This movie has created an entirely new category in the movie world, aptly named Porno Sympathy. It's like a dirty old man on the street who opens his coat to show you what he's made of. I think they mean sympathy porn, but porno sympathy is how they worded it. So where does that fit? Porn? Dan, you want to take this one? Porno <laughs> sympathy? They meant sympathy porn, but kind of like torture porn. No, you know? no, I think they meant porno sympathy. Porn made for you to sympathize. Uh, I'm going to say this is a f- 4 out of 10. I'm going to go 6. Both way off. Though Dan is closest, it's a one-star review. Oh, wow. Ooh. Wow. Yep. Yep. Uh, let's see here. This next one, Mr. Kearns 2 says, for anyone interested in seeing the Green Mile, I have a recommendation. Stay home and watch the Shawshank Redemption. I'm going to go a 3 out of 10. 2 out of 10. Nigel's that price is right, me. Yeah. Well, Nigel's <laughs> right on the money, so God take it, it up with him. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I really want her piece. <laughs> we might have a chance to get this next one wrong. This one's from Charlie P5. They write, at least they did not bash Richard Nixon, but then it was set in the 1930s. I have no idea. That review makes no sense. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't. At least they didn't bash Richard Nixon, but the movie takes place in the 1930s. Um, I'm going to say 4 out of 10. I'm going to go 5 out of 10. Josh is closest on this one. This is a 9-star review. Wow. Oh, wow. I, I don't know why in the review they had to point out that they didn't bash Richard Nixon. I, I guess... Uh, supposedly this film had a quote-unquote liberal agenda. I, I don't know. It was one of those really long reviews, but they liked it, so there it makes, you go. Makes no sense, though, that the movie's not about anything in his presidency. The movie takes place before he even got into politics. Yeah, he wasn't elected to like 68 or 69, something like that. Yeah, 30 some odd years later. Yeah. Maybe it was bored in the 30s. I don't know. It's the internet. People find the weirdest things to complain about. Well, we did have that one guy who said that Explorers sucked because it stole from the movie that came out, you know, 11 years later. You got to expect these sorts of things, man. And expect this one from Chief Wahoo, who says, Wow, Tom Hanks can play a nice man in a long drama. We already know, Tom. Please. Try some variety here. <laughs> this sounds like uh, my points during the Apollo 13 episode when a lot of our audience doesn't realize that Tom Hanks used to be a comedian. I'm going to say three out of ten. I'm going to go five out of ten. I'm going to have to give the point to both of you because this was a four-star <laughs> review. I almost said four, too. Okay, so we tied that one there, Dan. Yes. Dan's still in the lead, but I think you could come up... I don't know how points work because math is what I'm failing at today. But this final one, it was brought to you by Movie 12, who says, brought to you by Warner Brothers. Fuck you, Tom. (laughs) He's like, fuck you, Tom. Um, I'm going to go six out of ten. I'm going to go... Uh, no, I'm going to go three again. Three out of ten. Josh is closest. This was from a ten-star review. Again, a really long, rambling review, and then they just end it with that snarky, brought to you by Warner Brothers. I so don't who, know who why they herpes? End it. Everybody gets herpes. Oh, God. Damn it. 
It's Florida all over again. <laughs> no, but seriously, we do need to start having a punishment for the loser. We did strap Tom to an electric chair. We did, we did, but it's just because it's Tom. I don't like that that's the excuse you guys get for every terrible thing you do to me. Could we stop doing terrible things uh, to Tom? No. Tom. Dan. Play the music. Welcome back to yet another electrifying episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and warden on the block, Tom. And good news! I just got a call from the governor, and you're all on the pardoned list! Woohoo! Thanks again for joining us as we walk the Green Mile down this field trip to Kingtown towards the destination of It. And yes, we know these next two movies are going to feel like several miles. But boy howdy, are there ever some sights to see on this walk. And speaking of sights, how about we let some sponsors show off some of what they want to show? Donato's needs to sponsor us. Their, their, food, their, their pizza's amazing, and I would absolutely love to get a free pizza from them every week. So Donato's, if you're listening, or you're somebody closely related to a Donato's and you need a shout out, by all means, contact us, and we will give you the most amazing ad ever for free pizza. We're a cheap date. We're easy, too. We put out. We put out on the first date. We put out probably in the first 20 minutes, if you provide free pizza. At least I know I will. My wife isn't happy about that, but that's how it is. I'm into the kinky shit, too, if you're interested. So, Donato's, if you're listening. We put out kinky shit, and yeah, cheap date. There you go. <laughs> We're not using that. I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor, Rob's Custom PCs. He just built Tom's rig that he's using to edit our fine podcast. And he's also open for any kind of builds. You can either give him a list of parts or a budget that you're wanting, and he can find something that'll fit your needs. And he's also got a couple of pre-builds that he'll price on for you too. And then you can find a link to his Facebook page also on the firepit.podbean.com site. Go ahead and like his page and follow it and uh, maybe reach out to Rob and see if he can help you build a PC. But can we also I... talk about how amazing Tom's negotiating skills was in getting us that sponsorship, Dan? Yes, it's the best sponsorship ever for the sponsor because Rob's not actually paying us. He charged Tom to build his PC. And we are plugging his business for free on our podcast because Tom sucks at negotiation. Yeah. Didn't so... even give him a discount to help us plug it. And I'm not saying that is a bad thing. He builds a good PC. Tom can attest to that, and... right, Tom? Oh, yeah. There are no complaints on my side. I just wish he had built my router and <laughs> everything else that's internet connection wise, because that's been the unreliable one for me today. But I've got no complaints. He knew what I wanted, knew what I needed, and got it for me at a reasonable price. And he can do the same for you. He's got a pin description of basic builds he does, custom builds. But if you have something else in mind, just work with him. He'll get you sorted out. And definitely like his page on Facebook. He actually has a lot of good information to keep you abreast of uh breast of uh <laughs> pc uh news day to day like you posted something this past week about if you're interested in getting a solid state disc get it now prices are low so because i was following him i was able to see that and be like oh shit i need to go buy a new ssd i yep. don't need to but i did again you'll find the link in the episode it's description <laughs> it's rob's custom pcs and if you want us to plug your goods or just want to tell us to plug our holes, you can email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just put fire pit in the subject line as well as you're emailing about comments, concerns, ads, recommendations, or what have you. And write us what you got on your mind. And we'll take what you give and get right around to never responding. I mean, yeah, we'll read it, and don't worry, we'll be sure the check clears when we do the ads, but us responding to you is one thing you'll never have to worry about. That email again, of course, is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, 
at gmail.com. But of course, if you just want to chat with us and other fans, you can join us on our Discord. Uh, the link you can find on our main Podbean page. Just give it a link, give it a click, and join in on the discourse. And speaking of discourse, how about we uh, put our ears to the door and hear what our team has to say about the movie so far? So is this a movie about a prison or a movie about old people? It's both. It's an old people's prison. Well, fun fact about this movie, mm-hmm. apparently Stephen King wrote this as a serial, so like 100 pages at a time, because he was tired of people buying his books, turning to the last page, and spoiling the ending. So he's like, I'm going to release this a little bit at a time and just force people to read it. Joke's on you, Mr. King. I'm a comic book fan. I always wait for the trade paperback. Ha ha ha. Being old sucks. I know, you guys are almost 40. Yeah, we almost look like this guy. Oh my god, I remember the pocket fisherman. Do they still sell that? Kids, if you're listening in the audience, you have no idea how good you have it. When you had, when you were like an insomniac and you stayed up late, this is what you watched was infomercials. So you remember like the rotisserie thing? Set it and forget it. What do you call a vegetarian with diarrhea? Uh, salad shooter. Oh God, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> hey Josh, remember that streak of no downloads? Well, there yeah, we're off. about to hit a new one. <laughs> Uh, Bob's crying again. God damn oh, it. Paul's crying. Paul's crying. I'm sorry I'm old. I don't remember names no more. Wait, you're saying that a black man didn't get a fair trial on Alabama in the 30s? God, there's that guy who's in everything that you never know his name. What's his name again? I have no idea. Guy who's in everything. You, know, you can tell a scene is intense when the three of us have nothing to say. Exactly. <laughs> remember when we watched a film about kids finding a spaceship? This is what really happened. Oh, God. God. They didn't actually go to space, Tom. The spaceship was the happy place when they closed their eyes. I already have sympathy for this character. Pops back to life and grabs him. Gotcha! (laughs) Hey, there he is. Hey, Zephyr Cochran. You know why I built this prison? Dollar signs. Money. Sorry, I I have to say that every time I see him. Okay, uh, I have seen this movie all the way through. I'm remembering a lot more about it every time like more scenes progress you say that like it's a bad thing josh well i am a strapping young man so far my memory isn't deteriorating like yours tom remember when you thought the 90s was only 11 years ago early signs of dementia well you know when someone straps you into an electric chair it kind of affects things electroshock therapy it's supposed to help the dementia you you don't even remember what happened yesterday don't you if you don't remember i don't want you to have to really relive that i probably would remember it but again someone strapped me into an electric chair just 10 minutes ago just be glad you don't have to remember that remember what you're welcome god how boring would that job have been without the internet or television well Judging by what they're doing right now, pretty goddamn boring. Is that you, Dan? Doing what? I think you're falling asleep. No, I'm not falling asleep. Why? <laughs> oh, it just sounded like you're snoring. Or is that Tom? Is Tom falling asleep? No, I just showed back up. Oh, Maybe it's it was just the sound of Tom aging. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, that could not have been pleasant. No. I think almost hanging until death would be a better way to go. <sighs> Depends on which side of the noose you're on. God damn, Michael Clark Duncan was such a good actor. He was amazing. I miss him so much. He was in that x-ray room for 30 minutes. Dude, he's lucky his wife doesn't have superpowers. I get it. Give me a quick candy and just go right to bed. Uh, You're all the same. (laughs) Fine, I got you real quick. Hang on, I'm tired. (laughs) All right, are you good? I'm going to sleep. (laughs) Those kids are awfully blonde for such a dark-haired daddy. (laughs) Just saying. It's funny, his moon pies are still around. Because they just had so much of a surplus back in the 1930s. They're still trying to get rid of them. I firmly believe that all of those heart candies that you see around Valentine's Day were all made in... Oh, (laughs) dude. Dude, not cool with the COVID. (laughs) I know. What about your social distancing? He's getting high off a dead rat. I think they call it becoming a mouseketeer. M-I-C-K-E-Y. I'm not paying royalties for this song. Rickety house. (laughs) Oh, I'm eating, and I remember this part. Shit. I never want to be in a position where I have to face my mortality so openly. Yeah. Well, don't go on death row. That sounds easy enough. Tell that to John Coffey. Yeah, I do not want to watch this part. 
Oh, it's it's rough. It's like it's the stabbing scene in Saving Private Ryan. I can't do it. Oof. <laughs> I'm literally flinching. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm like, oh my god, I can't do this. I'm really glad I sprung for this new router so I can hear all your butts clenching at like gigabit speeds here. Sick bastard. Yeah, this guy's more sadistic than anyone on death row. Oh, oh god. god. You got what you wanted, you sick son of a bitch. Oh, fuck, fuck me running. Just shoot him already. It'll that, be over. The thing that makes this doubly disturbing is that while it was rare, this is truth in television. This actually happened once in a while. Christ. Don't be a nice guy in a Stephen King story. This is what happens. So is he legitimately insane? It's one of those things. It's like in the 1930s, he was a uh, madman. Today, he would have severe mental issues. No, nah, he'd be in politics right now. It's RC Cola. It's barely good enough for humans. I'm pretty sure guys on death row can have it. Oh, come on. They're going through enough as it is. Why you got to torture him like that? <laughs> I think I'd rather be electrocuted without the sponge than drink RC Cola. Of course, back then it was probably made with real sugar and not all that high fructose corn syrup bullshit. Still tasted like real shit. Ain't the sugar that makes RC Cola taste like ass. It's the rest of the ingredients. The sugar at least makes it drinkable. This episode not brought to you by RC Cola. <laughs> I could. They approached us and said, "We'll give you a lifetime supply of RC Cola and diet right if you uh, shout us out on your podcast." I'd be like, "Don't you threaten me." <laughs> <laughs> See, that's not the cancer making her that angry. It's it's the fact that it's two in the fucking morning. Yeah, yeah, I sound like that at two in the morning. Yeah, I do too. Ah, okay, I get it. This is the cuckold part of the movie. I don't <laughs> know. Most awkward kiss ever. This whole scene is just really bad out of context. Yes. There's got to be some kind of a trope. Sam Rockwell with, like, bad teeth means he's a bad guy. Well, no, that wouldn't be much because he was in Iron Man 2. And those teeth, pristine. But he was just a douche. He's a genuinely bad man in this movie. Fair point. Hey, he got to move to the insane asylum. Oh, God, this is 1930s insane asylum. He'd be better off in prison. He feels all the pain and horror in the world. This takes place in the mid-30s. What's going on in Europe right now? The Shit. Spanish Inquisition? Yeah, the Spanish Inquisition in 1930s Europe. <laughs> I mean, your eyes are basically going to pop right out into the front row, but okay. Maybe one of the people in the audience could catch it like a wedding bouquet. <gasps> You're the next one to be executed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want it! <laughs> Slow and old. He looks how Tom feels. He was 44? Wasn't he a kid? No. That's Tom Hanks. That's old Tom Hanks. I thought it was Paul. That's the Tom Hanks' character's name. Gosh, who's the old one kids. now, Josh? Sucks he's got to be, like, old like that, though. Like, that's a wrong kind of immortality. Can't you just cut off someone's head and get the quickening or something? That's not how it works, is it? No. no. Damn it. <laughs> oh, that's Sam Rockwell. What trouble won't he get into? Of course, you can continue to follow us and the team on our antics by heading to firepit.podbean.com. Podbean, a splendid hosted site and hosting site where you can listen to all of our past, present, and future episodes, as well as listen to podcasts like Critical Role. Give it a listen. Hear what you like. But that light says that we're charged up and ready to get back into the podcast. Thank you for listening, and as always, good luck. <laughs> well, that's a note to go out on. Whew. <laughs> so, I need a hug. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, who wants a summary? <laughs> um. This movie is sad the end this i'll is... take it this week yeah tom, you can get it next week okay yeah oh, that means tom gets shot <laughs> yeah dear god why did we put these films back to back that's we chose josh's list yeah my never, list bitches never again <laughs> hey hey you forget we got swashbuckler and dead calm on tom's list we did well josh the green mile is yours. Uh, okay, good lord. Okay, so this movie starts in an old folks' home where an elderly Tom Hanks' character, apparently I didn't realize until the end of the film because I'm dumb, <laughs> and he uh, sees a movie. It, uh, he starts crying, so uh, one of his friends takes him out, and he begins explaining the story about how in the 1930s he was a uh, 
officer on death row. Basically, ta- goes through and talks about how he went through the whole rigmarole of being on death row on the Green Mile, they called it, not the last mile because of the green floors. And then you're introduced to a French man who's not all there. And then you're introduced to a mouse, Mr. Jangles, we learn later on. The uh, French man, the friend's Mr. Jangles. So Tom oh, Hanks' character yeah. has a, a urine, urine issue where he can't pee. John Coffey grabs him by the balls and uh, pulls it out of him. And then Mr. Jangles gets stepped on by the douchebag guard. John Coffey brings him back to life. The douchebag guard also forgot to push the sponge on Dell's head, the guy who owned the mouse. And he ended up giving him a very brutal and very raw scene in the movie where he died without the help of the water. We learn more about John Coffey's abilities. We learn that he didn't actually kill the two girls he was sentenced to death for. He goes and he saves Zephram Cochran's uh, wife from her brain tumor. And then he puts that evil into uh, the douchebag guard who turns around and kills Sam Rockwell's character to death. Then he goes to an insane asylum. Then they end up having to kill John Coffey. Incidentally, yeah. what... Why was Coffey in death row? Because he was framed for, or not framed, murdering and raping two young girls. And that's what Sam Rockwell's character did. Yeah. Which we find out after he's shot to death. And then it flashed back to the normal times where we learn that the mouse is still alive and it ends on a very depressing note and Dan needs a hug. The end. So yeah, um, Tom, what are your thoughts since you were the one who hadn't seen this yet? Oh boy, this is a heavy film. Uh, <laughs> ho, ho. Um, I'm finding myself being unfair to this film by comparing it already to The Green Mile. These are two films about prison. This is The Green Mile. Yeah, this was The Green Mile. I mean, the um, Shawshank Redemption. Sorry, I feel like I'm still on The Green Mile. Age Even, has that effect on people. As you've mentioned many times as we were watching this, I mean, it's good to see that you know, Stephen King decided I want to make two stories about prisons and made two completely different stories. Quality writer right there. This, I don't know if this movie was slow or purposeful. It was heavy though. It definitely made it a very heavy story. I think things could have been edited better to make it feel less like it was just taking its time for lack of a better term it wasn't going to anything except the inevitable you know execution it was a tour i felt like it was on a tour it's like eventually you're just going to get to your destination but i can't say it hurt it though at the end of this yeah i'm i want to lie down and cry a little bit it worked i felt bad i feel bad i'm gonna feel bad tomorrow I think that's my takeaway. It's it's good. It's just not great. I'm not in, inclined to see this again. That's but it's still a damn fine film. I have some more thoughts, but I'll send it over to Nigel next. Okay. Um. <clears throat> yeah. There's a lot to unpack here. There's also a lot to unpack in Swashbuckler too, but for completely different reasons. I agree with Tom. This was a heavy film. This is just this is not a casual watch. This is not a turn your brain off and just put it on in a background kind of movie. I have not seen this movie in a long time. And the last time I saw it, I was not old enough to appreciate the story. And my God, just at the end of this movie, I mean, I'm only half joking when I say I need a hug. Mm -hmm. It was just really heavy, really depressing. Not, yeah, it was depressing. I mean, of course, it's a movie. it's, It's a movie about death row. So, I mean, I'm not expecting jailhouse blues from elvis presley here i disagree though tom that you said it could have been edited better to make it not as long i kind of felt like it was edited just right to let the audience breathe these many 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 heavy moments that are in the movie and process them properly so i kind of enjoyed the editing but i'm also in agreement with you that i enjoyed this film it was a really good film i'm not inclined to see it again It might be another decade and a half before I watch it again, like it was the first time. Like, I'm just not in a rush to see this movie again. I think it's okay to compare it to Shawshank because, one, they're both Stephen King stories, and two, they're both directed by Frank Darabont. I think that's an apt comparison. But, yeah, heavy film, and I do mean a heavy film, like heavier than Michael Clark Duncan's character in the movie. I wondered who was going to make that joke. So I'll send it over to Josh. I want to parrot what you guys said about, yeah, very much a heavy film. 
one thing I got to compare it to is like, you know, you get those really rich chocolate cakes that have the chocolate pieces melted into the uh, mix. And like, it looks the most delicious thing ever. And you acknowledge it's a really good cake, but it's so rich. You can't finish eating it. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's what this movie feels like. You know how we have these movies that we like to watch that we always say that if I'm flipping through the channels and I see this on, I always stop and finish it. This is, I'm going to equate it to Jurassic Bark from Futurama. If I flip in channels and I see that that's on, I'm changing the channel. Not because I <laughs> hate that movie. It's because I don't think I could put myself through that again. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. Uh, but, I always quote that episode. Especially with Tom when I'm joking with him, like I always quote the ah, now I'm all you got. <laughs> oh, but I can't watch I've only seen that episode maybe four or five times. Like I that episode is so fing sad. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I keep Even waiting. though they kind of retconned it that Fry was there and he didn't die a lonely death. I still can't watch that episode. Same thing with like the uh, luck of the Fryish. Yeah, it's when you find out it, it wasn't his brother, it's his, it's his nephew or something like yeah. that. But then again, that was also retcon because he did spend time with his family because he was he went back in time and yeah. did all that. Stuff. And that's kind of how the Sam Rockwell getting shot thing is like. Oh, he murdered the girls. You know, Coffee was completely innocent. That's kind of how that scene felt. It was just a a nice little happy bow for the audience because you didn't want them to feel too sad because you when it's like oh he didn't kill those girls he was completely innocent after all at least that's kind of how it felt to me i i could see that argument that's i'm not like i disagree with it but it's one of those things where it's like i understand your argument yeah it definitely it's like it's it's not one of those things where like oh come on tom you're just not you have to you always have to be the one opinion in the room that's different from everyone else's. No, no, no. This is one where I can like, I could definitely see why mm-hmm. Tom would think this way and, and why you think that's way, why I think this way. So mm. yeah. All Go I got to say is I disagree with Tom again, like, like you do Nigel on editing down. I, yeah. We need that space between, I think that it does a great job of doing character building on all the characters with the exception of uh, the young kid who I mistook. Oh, um, Barry, Barry Pepper's yeah. character. Yeah. But um, I think everybody had good character building in this movie, down to the uh, Delacroix character, even the douchebag character. I mean, like I said, I think he is a great villain in this film. He does a great job. And you really learn watching this to hate this guy, not because, you know, he kicks a dog, but because he literally steps on a mouse, which, you know, you haven't felt like that since an American tale about a mouse. I don't know. It's just if this movie is definitely heavy and it's got a lot of elements to it that I think are very deliberate. It is a lot to take in, and it's definitely something you need to set aside time to watch. Yeah, and you need to be able to process it. And it's just, it's not a movie for the faint of heart. That execution scene, the botched one, is still hard for me to watch. Oh, oh my God. And I just realized while we were watching it, that scene, if Claire ever watches it, it's going to be even harder to watch. Because the guy being killed is the same guy who plays Mr. Noodle in Elmo's World, if you ever watch Sesame Street. So... Oh, no kidding. They killed Mr. <laughs> Noodle. What the fuck, man? <laughs> There's scenes in movies that I've seen them once or twice and I can't watch them again. I cannot sit through and physically watch it. And that scene is one of them. And when the one guy's dying in Saving Private Ryan, when the Nazi's slowly driving the knife into his chest, I cannot watch that scene. There's just some scenes that I just can't watch in certain movies. I've forgotten about this one. It was almost like um, a repressed memory coming back because as it was getting really close to that scene, like, oh no, I remember this. Oh no, I remember. Oh, I'm eating. Oh, I <laughs> oh no, I remember this. No, no, no. Yeah, same I, for me. I, I think I repressed this movie. That's why it feels like I haven't yeah. seen it. Because it's yeah. like, as we were watching it, I'm remembering each beat of the movie. I'm like, oh yeah, this happens now. This happens now. Oh, God. Yeah, like Why I, am I, I doing this to myself again? I was almost in a hypnotic state, a trance, watching the movie. And I'm like, oh, wait, maybe this is a different cut of the movie and this scene's not in there. No, that's that's not how this works, Dan. You know that. Mm. Maybe so, they'll let him go this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have to say that um, this might be the deepest movie we've watched so far on this podcast. As far as like just story driven and how, well, we keep saying the term, how heavy it is, just how much is in this movie Mm. to process. This might be the biggest one we've done on this channel. And I don't just mean in length as far as like the movies, one of the longest we've watched, because actually the right stuff was longer. There's like even Stand By Me was deep to a level. 
but this felt like where Stand By Me was a shallow wading pool. This is fucking Mariana's Trench. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Boy, is it. Although I'd find a lot of, I don't know how you would say it. There's, there's some things that stand out that keep this from being a great film, like Shawshank and Stand By Me, too. Just, did anyone else feel that, you know, Sam Rockwell's character being killed by the douchebag just was an out-of-nowhere thing? Just, it was a loose end that they had to wrap up? I can see where you would think that. I can definitely, I, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I can definitely see how you came to that conclusion that it definitely felt like, oh, crap, we got to tie up this loose end before we kill Michael mm-hmm. Horton Douglas' character. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but we really... got to take care of these two D-bag characters, but we got to do it fairly quickly because we're getting to the end of the film and John Coffey needs to die too. It, it didn't really resolve anything, though. It's not like any one of them was going to do anything. It didn't take away the moment, but it didn't add to anything either. It felt unnecessary. It was shocking, but I don't think it was needed at all. So how yeah. do you feel like it could have been done? Well, I don't want to editorialize the film. I, 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 I would have liked, I honestly, if, far be it for me to critique King's work or storytelling, but I think I would have just had it that Michael Clark Duncan's character definitely didn't kill those girls, but I don't know if I would have just had it conveniently that Sam Rockwell was the one that did it. I kind of would have liked it just to have been a random act of violence that never was solved, but we definitely knew it wasn't Michael Clark Duncan that did it. Because then when they get to the execution scene and the dad says, make sure you kill him twice, it makes the dad look a little more like a douchebag than he probably should come off as because he doesn't know. He doesn't know that Michael Clark Duncan didn't actually kill his girls, Mm -hmm. but the audience now knows that Michael Clark Duncan didn't actually kill girls. And the audience also knows that... It was Sam Rockwell's character that killed the girls, and he died. Technically, the girls already got their justice. It takes a scene that's already really sad. They're killing Michael Clark Duncan, and he's completely innocent of those crimes. And it just shits on it again. Like, it's... it's... I wouldn't say that. I would say, honestly, it layers it a lot more. Because you're forced to see it through John Coffey's eyes, where he was genuinely heartbroken that he could not save those kids. You're seeing it through the eyes of the guards who are genuinely heartbroken because they know he's innocent and they still have to pull the trigger, so to speak. But you're also seeing it through the eyes of the dad and the parents who lost their freaking children. And this is the man that was convicted. You know, pure emotional rage. And granted, the level of racism that would be around in the 30s, it's very deep because you feel from each one of these people's emotions. So you got to feel hatred one second while hearing this guy. But at the same time, you want to feel sympathy while feeling fear. So it's like all these emotions fighting you because you can see nobody is in the wrong in this scene yeah i can see both sides i just think it would have maybe been a little bit of a deeper story on an already deep story if it had been just a random act or something like that it might have been a little better but then again i don't know i'm not you know keep in mind they did establish early on in the uh movie right before they brought in wild bill into the story that he had been jumping around the state getting into all kinds of trouble apparently Uh, enough trouble to warrant the death penalty so it had been established that he has been a local terrorist basically if you want to go that route like he's getting into shit around everything and he definitely has mental health issues absolutely yes the way it just happened and just wrapped it up that way it didn't feel i I see what you're saying i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off no no you're fine you continue you continue well i was just gonna say yeah it did feel like it was very wrapped up with a bow on top but at the same time it kind of plays into the the setting of the movie john coffee isn't looking for everybody to accept him or Sam Rockwell is the bad guy. He's like, Mm. he's a bad man. I need to end him. So he does it in the most convenient, easiest way possible for him. Because remember, that scene started not with his decision. It was uh, when they decided to take him to go see Zephyr Cochran's wife. And then Sam Rockwell reached out and grabbed him in his drunken stupor. That's when he realized what happened. You knew that was when uh, he's like... Yeah, when he touched his arm and he said, you're a bad man, you're a bad, bad man, or whatever, yeah. So that that scene started in that point right there. Oh, yeah, and you make a good point. I completely forgot about that moment. Same here. Uh, Yeah, it didn't hit me until then either. So I kind of, okay, I I retract my previous statement on it shouldn't have been Sam Rockwell that killed the kids, but... I still stand by mine and Tom's opinion that it felt like that was just wrapped up too nicely towards the end of the movie for the sake of wrapping it up. Yeah, especially Mm. for a film that took its time building everything, letting it slow. Yeah, there was a lot of really quick beats in a row right there from when we got like started off the movie. It was a lot of beats, but there was a lot of space 
like Dan said, time to breathe, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The end of the movie did feel a little rushed, which is amazing because the movie's three hours and like 10 minutes long. Mm-hmm. But, the, but the end of the movie felt like, well, like when a, a speaker or a comedian's up on stage for too long and the light starts flashing for them to get off the stage. That, <laughs> the, end, the ending of this film felt like, okay, it's three hours, guys. Go. Come on. We got to wrap this up. Mm-hmm. Eight minutes. Finish it. You better figure something out because now you got seven minutes. Yeah, we all feel like the old guy at the beginning of this film now. Let's let's move it yeah. along. Which is amazing because, like I said, the movie's like three hours and some odd minutes, but the ending does feel very, very rushed. Also, it takes about an hour for them to even introduce Michael Clark Duncan and about an hour more before they do anything with him. Yeah, I mean, every death in this movie, every execution, I should say, is very deliberate because there's only three of them in the film. You got uh, the Graham Greene character, Mm -hmm. the first execution. That was required to show how it's done. Then you had the Delacroix character who was to show... Percy's a dick. And then you had John Coffey, which was by this point, we'd seen two. We've seen it go right. We've seen it go wrong. And now we want to see it not go off type thing, you know? Yeah. Although it was nice of them not to show the execution with Michael Clark Duncan. It was just like, don't show it. Yeah. Yeah. I got him his like straining face. And then you see Tom Hanks expression as he has to watch it. It was classily done. But again, that's what leads me to my conclusion that should have been edited differently. You have Duncan's character there for like a good hour or so. And he doesn't really do anything. Uh, that's me rambling. I, I don't want to editorialize. I don't want to say, well, this is how they should have done it. That's mm. no, no. The movie's done. They did it the way they did it. This is why I, I can respect that. I, I totally see. This is one of those movies I think that deserves to be dissected. You can break it down scene by scene and you can uh, see each motion as a deliberate action by the author or director or whatever mm-hmm. to play into the next scene. I think this is the type of movie that deserves that kind of treatment. Not like uh, some shitty-ass movie where a look can be interpreted as something, when it's nothing there. Mm-hmm. I'm talking to you, episode 8 and 9. You're garbage. <laughs> and no, there was nothing deliberate about any look given by anything with the exception of Luke looking at C-3PO because Rian Johnson is a hack. <laughs> Okay, come on. That's like the third episode in a row. We go on a Star Wars tangent. Uh, that's it. That's it for me. That's it for me. I'm just saying, I think this movie deserves the level of dis- not discretion. What's the word I'm looking for? Dissemination. No. Not dissection. So maybe dissection. It deserves to be dissected. Yes, I think that's the word I'm looking for. Thank you, Tom. For reminding <laughs> you of the words you used like five minutes ago. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, it deserves to be dissected like that. Yes, thank you. Let's rip it open, spill out its guts. So to tell us what lighthearted film we're going to be watching next week, Nigel? Well, uh, we go from a lighthearted, whimsical film about uh, electric chair executions to a lighthearted, whimsical film about long-term prison sentences and gang rape. We're following Jeffrey DeMunn and for the first time following a director to The Shawshank Redemption, another movie directed and written by Frank Darabont. At least the screenplay was written by him. Another movie based on a Stephen King novel. So that will be our next stop on the field trip to Kingtown. It'll be a wonderful trip to Mansfield, Ohio. Yay, Mansfield! Woo! Is that where it's supposed to be at? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think the in the movie itself that's where Shawshank Prison is, but the entire movie was filmed in the, the prison at Mansfield, yeah. Ohio. They still give tours and stuff in it. They have a billboard on my drive to my reserve duty every month. Yeah. Like they have a billboard that advertises based off of the season. So like Halloween's coming up, so it's going to be a scary house. Nice. Yeah. So anyways, that's what we're watching next week. Should be another, um, you know, lighthearted affair. Lots of laughs. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of laughs. A lot yeah. of, uh, yeah. I got a feeling that Roger after Freeman uh, talking it, like this, <laughs> I got a feeling that if we go to the, we go, we're going to it chapter one. We're going to need to go on like a comedy tour or something. But no, we appreciate everyone joining. Thank you for everyone who's listening. You can, of course, find us online at firepit.podbean.com. That's our main hosting site. We're found on Podbean. Fantastic podcast hosting site home to many a good podcast and ours of course you can also find us on spotify i amazon google and pretty much anywhere else that anywhere uh, fine podcasts can be found yes fine podcasts we emphasize italicize that even and where can they reach out to us if they have any thoughts comments or questions guys well, if they go to our website, they can access 
our Discord server. We have an invite available there, and we look forward to being told all the ways in which we are wrong. So if you definitely want a shout out um, on a future episode, log into our Discord, say, drop us a line, and we'll happily give you a shout out because, you know, we're desperate for attention. So anything we're willing to do is to reciprocate. Now, when we're big and famous, we're going to ignore you, but we need that attention now. Yes. We're whores like that. Yes, we, we are. We want that attention. And speaking of attention, do we have any new attention givers this time around? Any no, shout outs? I don't have any specific new ones, but uh, I will say this. Like last, uh, what was it, one week or two weeks ago? We've given Brad Boys our shout out for our being our 100th listener. We're working on 300 views, so thank you for listening, and please, uh, we we appreciate every one of our uh, listeners. So I mean, we're we're gonna do this regardless whether or not we have listeners, but it definitely makes us feel appreciated. Yeah, so keep on keep on downloading, keep on listening, spread the word. You know, it really helps us out. Like Josh said, though, we're not doing this to get uh, rich and famous. We're just three guys want to talk about movies. Any friends of the podcast, Nigel? Oh, yeah. Always friend Peggy, friend of the channel. The OG. Yeah, the OG. She's doing well. Really enjoyed last week's episode. Thanks for listening. But until next time, I've been Tom. I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. This has been The Fire Pit. Thank you for joining. A production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Thank you for listening. Good luck out there. Da, 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 da. We did it. Excellent. It was a long episode, but it was fun. You know, one thing I will admit, uh, since we've been doing this podcast, I think we're all like more in agreement than not about a movie. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's an interesting take on our movie watchingness. We're growing more sophisticated in our film watching and critiquing and worse about talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god we're regressing this film are good we're a year away from just saying you know what batman versus superman was underrated i think it was too smart for its audience <laughs> yeah you know what i think we need to watch pathfinder and swashbuckler again guys i don't think we gave that the good rap it deserves <laughs>